Hey everyone, Gaijin here. So I've been sitting here thinking about what in the world I'm going to talk about next when it comes to these videos, and I'm also doing that while Texas is having some of the coldest weather it has ever had on record, including crazy amounts of snowfall that has had me locked in my apartment for days at a time, and I sat here thinking to myself, man, when was it this cold last? When was I this cold in my own home last? And I thought back to when I was living abroad, uh, back in, in Mie Prefecture, and I just remember the only source of heat that I had was this tiny little unit that also acted as, as my cooling unit, my heating unit, everything came in this, this little unit. And I remember I had a section off all of my apartment, doors, windows, everything, just to keep this one room cold because Japanese apartments and houses are not that well insulated. And I sat here thinking to myself, man, there's a lot about Japan that I just kind of don't like. There are just things about Japan that just kind of suck, and what I decided on is I'm going to cover the top five things that just utterly aggravate me about Japan. Because there are still a lot of people online that think, Oh, Gaijin, you only just talk about the nice things about Japan. You talk about the good things about Japan. You talk about the things that you like about Japan. You just only love Japan. You're a freaking weibu. No! <laughs> <laughs> I could probably do another channel on the stuff that, that just, just Japan drives me crazy about. Because, no, I'm not mindlessly in love with the country. There, there are things that I just do not like. But I want to make one clarification for this particular video. This is not aimed at people. This is not aimed at Japanese people. Because people are people. There are some good people. There are some bad people. There are some truly reprehensible people that exist in every single country, every single community ever. What I want to talk about are, with the things that I hate about Japan are more overarching issues. So basically things that are enforced by either government or big business or maybe they're sort of bigger sociological consensus things that just kind of drive me up the wall. And the thing is too is that I'm pretty sure there are going to be people possibly watching this who are living in Japan or who are Japanese that will probably agree with me on some of these things. But don't get me wrong, I still love Japan no matter what you see or hear in this video. Bottom line, I still love Japan, but it's got some nasty flaws and these are my top five. Number five, plastic waste. Now, before I say anything, I fully recognize that the United States, my home country, is one of, if not the biggest culprits for when it comes to plastic waste. And that's why this particular thing bothers me so much, is because I never want to be part of this problem. Because when it comes to garbage-related problems, it can start off being in one country, one area or something, and it's going to turn into a big global problem if it's not adequately taken care of. And the fact that this is a problem in Japan is something that actually struck me as kind of weird because Japan is a very environmentally friendly country. You're going to see a lot of people making a lot of effort to conserve, reuse, recycle, all that jazz. And I think a lot of that really does come from the country's extensive history with, with religions that are eco-friendly like Buddhism and Shintoism. That's what makes this one such a strange thing for me. But the fact of the matter is, if you ever live in Japan or visit Japan, you're going to discover that there are a lot of individually wrapped things in plastic, particularly food. Food is the big culprit when it comes to this. You go to a Japanese grocery, you're going to find individually plastically wrapped fruits, vegetables, just everything is kind of singled out and just completely wrapped up in plastic. I mean, the Washington posted a really good job showing off just how much things are wrapped up in plastic and just how much plastic waste is made in the process of making one simple meal. So you're probably asking yourself at this point, why in the world does Japan do this? Why, why is a country that is so focused on environmentalism just this wasteful with plastic? Well, there are three things that I think kind of contribute to this. The first one is omotenashi, which is loosely translated as customer service. And I can kind of understand where this is coming from, because if you've got people all day picking up fruit and putting it down, picking up vegetables, putting it down, picking up packages, putting them down, especially when it comes to the issue of COVID going on right now, I can completely understand where this is coming from. I mean, viruses aside, this is very much a Japanese thing when it comes to products that other people are going to be handling. People want things to be kept fresh and clean. I absolutely get that. Number two, omiyage. Now, to define that, omiyage are basically little gifts that you give to either your office mates or, or your co-teachers, in my case, where if, if you go off on a vacation either to another part of Japan or maybe to a different country, you're kind of expected to come back and bring with you 
maybe not expensive souvenirs, but maybe little snack specialties of the particular region that you went to. I saw this happen a lot back when I was working abroad. I did this a lot when I was working abroad, and it is very much an expected thing, and it's, it is very nice. But the thing is, is that since you're getting basically a box of, of sweets or snacks, maybe about yay big, everything has to be individually wrapped. Because if you just open up a box, again, it's that kind of idea of, uh, people are putting their hands in, it's kind of exposed. So therefore, just for everyone's sake, it's wrapped up in plastic individually. And then the last one, I admit, is complete speculation. But I think a lot of times things are individually wrapped, especially when it comes to food sold in Japan, because it kind of helps out with the portion sizes. I've picked up a few things on my own here and there, and I, I really have noticed that despite all this plastic that's being used, it is really holding together what an appropriate balanced portion is, and yeah, as a guy who's trying to lose weight, I can respect that. But there are just some times that where I'm like, I don't get it. There are so many times where an item can be individually wrapped, placed in another plastic bag, and that plastic bag goes into someone else's plastic bag. It's just plastic upon plastic upon plastic. I've I've seen this. I've seen this literally just a few days ago when I was out buying candy. Yeah, I wanted to get individual portion sizes and whatnot, but it was a plastic bag that was in a plastic bag, and that first plastic bag had all the plastic bag individually wrapped pieces of this candy. And I'm just like, you don't need that much. But I think the biggest problem that happens, not just in Japan, but I think in a lot of different places, is people think that plastic can just be recycled infinitely. It can't. It can be recycled a certain number of times, and then that's kind of it. It's done. It can't do anything else. It can't become anything else. But the thing is, I think this is more of a big business and corporation and maybe a bit of a government issue. Not so much a personal one. I mean, when you look at it at an individual level, I've seen lots and lots of people in Japan who basically bring their own cloth and reusable bags and absolutely will not touch plastic bags. And you know what? That's a habit that I've been picking up on. And it's really, really, really helpful for the environment. In fact, I kind of went up to that, and my wife and I got these reusable kind of zippy bags. And the food tastes just as good, it's still just as convenient, and it really works. But I gotta give the Japanese government some amount of credit. By 2030, they're trying to have Japan reduce its plastic use by about 25%. And they're doing that by doing things like forcing grocery stores to charge people for using plastic bags. No, I think this is actually going to be a big business problem, with companies who are either going to be too lazy to want to change anything, or who are too worried about their profit margin in order to make any sort of ecological friendly changes. Number 4, Shogunai or Shikataganai Syndrome. Now, I've talked about this before. Shogunai or Shikataganai basically kind of means it can't be helped. There's a situation that you gotta just kinda plow through, Shogunai, it can't be helped. You just gotta make your way, force your way through, hope that you can get through it. And this was pretty low on my list because this is an issue in Japan that doesn't really affect anyone who's traveling there just to visit, even for an extended period of time. This mostly affects people who are living and working in Japan and how this could just get really frustrating. Because it absolutely irritated the crap out of me in a lot of instances. But not all instances. Because Shogunai is actually kind of appropriate. There are just instances where there's nothing you can do about a situation and you just have to muscle through it and power through it. It's something that I actually learned from Japan that I brought back here that's bettered my personal life. It's not a matter of, oh, well, I gotta get this done, so I'm gonna complain about it. You just push through it, and you get it done. But there have been so many other times where I've heard people in Japan use Shogunai or Shikataganai as a kind of de facto when it comes to just really big problems that no one really wants to think about. Aging problem? Work-life balance problem? Bullying? Shogunai? Shikataganai? I just... People are dying from this, and they're still dying from this. And what really gets me up the wall is that these are problems that you're not gonna be able to avoid. At least not 30 years down the road when everyone's too old to work. These are problems that could either completely erode Japanese society, what it is, or possibly destroy it outright. And they, these aren't things that you can just be shikata ganai, shou ganai about. These are things you gotta consider. <laughs> Number three, absolutely nowhere to sit. You'd think in a society where people walk everywhere to get anywhere, there'd be a lot of places to sit, like benches and whatnot, right? Nope, there sure aren't. If you've got bad feet or bad legs, you're gonna have a bad time in Japan. I myself had experienced this firsthand. Now, my particular problem is that I've got turned out legs. So basically, from the knees down, my bones kind of twist and my feet turn out. So when I walk, I'm actually not walking on all my toes, I'm walking on the backside of my heel over to my big toe. Now let me tell you, the first time that I was in Japan, studying abroad, 
I did not prepare for this problem, and boy howdy did I freaking suffer for it. Horrible, I mean horrible. Blisters upon blisters upon blood blisters upon blisters. Every time that I go back to Japan now to visit, I make sure that I pack really thick socks and brand new shoes, because without those, my feet just shred. But what really sucks is that most of the time, if you want a place to get off your feet and let your legs rest for a while, Typically, the only place you're going to be able to go is a cafe. Now, this isn't inherently bad after all, as you might be able to experience some wacky food and drink related things in Japan, such as, oh, a melon soda ice cream float in a glass boot. But what usually happens is you're going to be spending money that you didn't either mean to or want to spend just so you can rest your feet. But I will say this, there is a bit of a cheat system. Look for the bars, particularly if you're in the Tokyo area. Uh, Akihabara's got a lot of these. If you go down the main strip, there are going to be, it's these two sets of bars that go across. I'll see if I can find a picture of them. But people will usually kind of squat and lean on them or sit on them. It's a way to get off your feet for a short period of time, but not comfortable enough to sit down for a long time. And then outside of the station in Akihabara, and I've seen these in Ikebukuro too, uh, particularly around trees or other posts or things like that, you'll find these circular bars that you could just kind of lean up or sit on. It's an absolute godsend when there are no benches around, because again, benches just, they don't exist for some reason. So look out for these bars and use them to rest your butt, rest your legs, rest your feet, you're gonna need it. Number two, Kata freaking Kana. Now, I tell a lot of my Japanese friends that this is really high on my list and it really surprises them, and I'll explain why here in a minute. Japanese is comprised of three different alphabets, katakana, hiragana, and kanji. Now, kanji is the one that typically most Japanese think that we hate the most, because this borrowed Chinese lettering system is... <sighs> Take one kanji, for example. This one kanji could have one to four different ways of reading and pronunciating it. And yeah, when you're sitting there trying to read out loud for whatever reason, just different Japanese words, this can actually be a really big hassle because you don't always have a tell to tell you what kind of pronunciation you should have for kanji. But here's the thing, kanji is symbolic, not phonetic. Here's the, I, could, I could look at this kanji and technically read it. I may not be able to pronounce it, but I know what the meaning is, and that's typically all that's going to matter if you're living and traveling abroad in Japan. Hiragana, on the other hand, is a bit more of a phonetic system, but it follows a very, very, very simple rule set. Consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel. And it's based on the chart, once you kind of look at it, it's not too hard to figure out. You're cross-referencing the consonants with the vowels, and there's only a, e, u, a, o, not a, e, i, o, u, so it's actually pretty simple. Japanese, as a language to speak and hear, is actually not that difficult. Only in a couple instances will Japanese take two consonants and put them next to a vowel. And even then, it's something like tsu. It doesn't happen that often. However, katakana takes all these different rules and just throws them right out the window. Let's use this for an example. This is u, this is e. Now tell me, what the heck is this? Now, w with, without having someone tell you, what the heck is this sound? Because it's got the little ten ten that will that will make a boo kind of sound, but this isn't boo. Wait, what's that? What is that? Oh, this is V. Okay, so never mind the fact that the two little ten ten don't make the boo sound, but how in the world do you get V out of U and E? And what's crazier, there is no V sound in the traditional Japanese alphabet. There is no V in the traditional Japanese alphabet. This freaking blows my mind. And this is when a mostly symbolic language becomes phonetic, and I absolutely hate it, because I feel like a moron trying to sit here and spell out a particular loan word, and even when I say it out loud, I just can't piece it together because it's so corrupted from its original English form. Meanwhile, my Japanese friends are laughing at me because I can't read this loan word that is apparently mine. Best, ex best example I could think of, McDonald's. McDonald's. You're gonna see a lot of McDonald's in Japan. Trust me, you're gonna see a lot of McDonald's in Japan. And despite the fact that they've, they've given a short name to Makudo or Maku, depending on which part of Japan that you live in, the actual name is Makudo Naruto. Makudo Naruto. Say that three times fast and don't get tongue-tied. And what people in Japan don't understand is that you're throwing in so many extra syllables that it makes it so freaking hard to read. Makudo Naruto. Six. McDonald's. Three, arguably two. You're extending the word so long that it's almost unrecognizable. This is why I cannot stand katakana. 
because it's supposed to be easier for us foreigners, but it absolutely is not, because you're taking this consonant vowel system of traditional Japanese and trying to apply it into English, which doesn't follow that, ro that rule at all, and then we're the ones getting laughed at because we can't read the simple word that's based on our own language, but it's not... Do you see why this is number two? And then we have number one, taking pictures. So, you guys ever wonder why when it comes to my videos here or my videos on my main channel, where if I'm pictured with one of my other friends, like either Tomo or Hutch, or the family that I was studying abroad with for my homestay, or just different friends that I have in Japan, all of them have either blacked out eyes, blacked out faces, or are completely mosaiced out. You wanna know why that is? Because privacy in Japan is just that important. And I can actually get behind this, especially in this day and age, when it's so easy for everyone's information to just be out there. In fact, there's actually a law when it concerns this kind of thing, the Tokyo Anti-Nuisance Ordinance. But the problem with this particular ordinance is that its wording is exceptionally vague when it comes to the issues of stalking and harassing, or tsukimatoi in Japanese. And how crazy can this get? Well, there was a 40-year-old man in Kawasaki City that was arrested for taking a full-body picture of a woman. Nothing scandalous about it, it wasn't an underskirt shot or, or trying to get a peek at anything, it was just a regular body shot, and this man was arrested for it. In fact, the law is actually getting so crazy that in 2018 there was a public pushback on the revisionism of this law because apparently anti-government tweets or pictures of protests could technically fall under this arrestable offense of law. And social media could be next. But here's the saving grace. When you typically go into an area where you're not allowed to take pictures, there are usually going to be signs where it says, don't take pictures, in a multitude of different languages, which, cool, I can respect that and I can honor that. You, you put a sign up and I get it. And before COVID, there was this big giant push to get signs around all these different corners in Kyoto to make sure that Geiko and Maiko weren't getting ambushed by people trying to take unsolicited pictures. These, these are fine things. I'm okay with these kinds of things. That is absolutely acceptable and understandable. Ambushing people for photos is absolutely scummy and I detest it just as much as the next guy. However, if I am in an alley or there's just nobody around, absolutely nobody to get in my frame and I take a picture and someone comes up to me and gives me lip about it, no, you get over yourself. And yes, this has actually happened not only to myself, but a multitude of people that I know. We're just trying to take pictures, we're trying to keep people's faces out of it, and then all of a sudden, out of seemingly the void, someone runs up and starts giving a slip about taking pictures. So let me give you guys a couple of examples. First of all, Chingodo Shrine Nasakusa. I absolutely had to get some pictures from this shrine, and here's why. It's because the whole shrine is dedicated to this group of tanuki that were relocated from Okuyama to Deboin, which are basically different districts in the area. And the funny thing is that when they were relocated, they were playing all these different pranks on the Sensoji monks at the temple that, that's really close by. I mean, it's one of the biggest tourist draws in the area. But this particular shrine was to basically try to, to, to pacify these little scams to prevent them from doing in these tricks. But on top of that, these tanuki promised that they would protect the temple from fires and other disasters. That's not even the whole story. At some point, I would love to do a video on it, but while I was at this shrine with a, vi with, with, with a friend, no one was around. Look at all, all these pictures I've been showing you guys. There was nobody around. I purposely made sure that there were nobody in these pictures. I got the last picture done and taken, and this, this middle-aged woman, I don't know where in the world she came from. She just started running up at me and was yelling at me not to take pictures. And I'm sitting here thinking, why? There are no signs around about not taking pictures. There was nobody else at the shrine except me and my friend. I couldn't figure out what the problem was. And then game centers. I don't know why it's game centers and arcades and things like that, but this is another big culprit that I've just had no end of problems with. So there are some arcades and game stores where they actually do have signs that say do not take pictures fine i respect that but there was one that didn't and this is kind of what drove me crazy i was playing i can't remember i think it was either taiko no tachijin or some kind of shooter i was playing with my buddy hutch right this arcade cabinet it faces a wall nobody could possibly be in the shot no one and in fact it's the back of my head and the back of hutch's head there's there's no way there's no way that anyone's gonna get caught in these photos right as soon as we were done, poor Aki, my wife Aki, gets approached by one of the Game Center staff members and said, and they said, no pictures. And I'm like, why? No one's in them. I just... <sighs> Look, when tourism comes back in Japan, 
people are gonna take pictures. They're just going to. Like, I don't know, I, I don't know what you expect. Like, there are some people who understand. There are some people who are like, oh, they're just foreigners, they're taking pictures for themselves. Cool. And then there are just some people who, again, you could be alone in an alley taking a picture of something, and they will come up to you and give you lip. They weren't even in the photo. I don't know what's up with that. Now, as I was alluding to, this does not happen all the time. In fact, there were a couple instances where I was pleasantly surprised. There was a super potato that I went to, and when I went to the guy behind the counter and I explained who I was and uh, what I did with work, like teaching people Japanese culture through video games, he kind of understood. He, he was like, okay, hang on. He physically positioned me in an area that was acceptable and actually grabbed a Mr. Saturn from Earthbound and let me hold it and then took the picture. That was super cool. The guy understood what I was trying to do. It wasn't trying to be malicious or anything, and he took the picture and it was great. And then some places in Akihabara, oh man, Dajio Kaikan. This place is like a massive, just huge store for all otaku things. And the cool thing about this store, they let you take pictures. Now, they've not said this, but I'm thinking to myself, this might be the reason why is because they have this giant mirrored showcase of all the new merch that they've got coming in. And everyone who's taking pictures of those, foreigner or domestic, that's all going to be free advertising for the new product that they're going to have coming in. That's going to be social media ad that they don't have to pay for. Again, I don't know if that's exactly what they're doing, but it's still freaking brilliant. I don't know. There's just... I could honestly go on and on with this. And again... This video isn't meant to attack Japanese people. It's more of just these big social issues that are still going on, and I, I think a lot of people even in, J in Japan can agree with some of these issues that are going on and why it's just so freaking frustrating. And I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have a part two down the line, another five things that irritate me about Japan. But I've been wanting to do a video like this for a long time because, like I said, there are so many people that are like, Oh, gotcha, you've been doing positive Japanese content for the last 10 years. You're just in love with it with rose tinted glasses. It's like, no, there are so many things that I don't like about it. But that's not the point. The point is, I still love the country despite the fact that there are problems with it. Just as there are problems everywhere in this world, no matter where you go, whatever country you go to, whatever neighborhood you live in, there's gonna be problems. There's no such thing as a perfect place. I recognize that, and I just want to express to people that Japan is not a perfect place. There's going to be problems. Some of them are going to be mild problems, some of them are going to be huge problems. I will probably be talking about more of these problems down the line, but I don't know. What do you guys think? For those of you who either live in Japan or have visited Japan or anything like that, what are some of the things that you've run into that just drove you absolutely crazy? Let me know in the comments below, and thank you so much for watching, guys. I know I just rambled super hard in this video, but man, just memories are flooding back to me like absolutely crazy. But I promise the next video is actually going to be a bit more positive and probably a bit more on task. But again, thank you guys so much for watching. And until next time, this is Gaijin, signing out.